Ich nehme Roll und habe Satellite jetzt so far. Is this, a, is this water for me? Uh -huh. Who put that there? What a gem, thanks for it. Well, um, have you ever had the experience of being in a lecture maybe, or a class, or a meeting at work, say, and uh, you were up late the night before because maybe you were partying, or uh, you had some coursework you to finish off, or for whatever reason, maybe you, were, maybe you didn't get to bed at all. And you're in, this, you're in this room now, and it's stuffy, and it's warm, and the sunlight is splashing across your face, and the lecture is going on and on, and you can just feel your eyelids getting heavier and heavier, and you, you fight it, and you really fight it, but you can just feel your, your, your chin nods against your chest, and you can feel yourself slipping slowly away. Then your eyes suddenly flip open, and you notice that the lecturer is glaring right at you as she speaks, and she's burning these two words into you with her eyes. Stay awake. Stay awake. Well, those, those two words are Jesus' words to his disciples in our passage this evening, and they are his words to us as well. Stay awake, he says. It doesn't mean physically stay awake, he's talking uh, spiritually. And the consequences for this kind of awakeness, alertness, aren't just an offended lecturer. Uh, they are a matter of life and death. Stay awake, Jesus says. Well, let's, uh, let's pray again together before we come to uh, Mark just now. Father, I pray that right now you would be with us by your spirit. Would you help us to stay awake, not just physically and mentally for the next half an hour, but would you spiritually awaken our souls to, to hear what you have to say to us by your word, through your spirit, and would you change us and mould us as a result. Amen. Okay, well, if, you, if you're new with us, then, then you won't know this, but we've been uh, reading through Mark's Gospel uh, so far this term of the evenings, and this is Mark 1, verse 1. This is the Gospel of Jesus, who is the Christ the Son of God. And Jesus' identity has been a huge theme all the way through the book. We've seen from the beginning of the Gospel that Jesus shows us his authority. His authority to, to teach, to forgive sin, his authority to heal the sick, to um, over demons, over the weather, over death itself. Because Jesus is the Christ. He is God's promised chosen king over everything. And we've, we've seen a bit, of, a bit of the prophet Daniel, that, that this is the one who Daniel saw coming, the son of man, the one, a human in other words, who, who comes on the clouds in glory with dominion and power and a kingdom that is to last forever. Jesus is, is the one with authority. And another prophecy that Mark spoke of from the beginning of the book that you may or may not remember is Malachi 3. Here it is from verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. We saw that, that Mark uses that to talk about John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Verse 5, then I will draw near to you for judgment. We've reached Mark 11 in, in our kind of walk through Mark tonight, and at the start of Mark 11, that's exactly what we see here. Jesus does exactly what Malachi foretold. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowds around him shout, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And Mark 11, verse 11, Jesus enters Jerusalem, and straight away he goes into the temple. The Lord has come to his temple, as Malachi said, and he's come to judge. Because what happens in Mark 11 is that Jesus doesn't like what he sees there, he, he sees salesmen buying and selling goods where, uh, where there should be worship. Ripping off worship as they are, taking advantage of God's precious flock. And so Jesus drives them out. And outside the temple, he gives his disciples an illustration. He comes across a fig tree, uh, often used as a kind of symbol of God's people in the Old Testament. And Jesus is hungry, but this fig tree bears no fruit for him to eat. And so he curses uh, 
bird of the fig tree. He judges the tree. He's come to judge. But the second thing we've seen through Mark so far is not just Jesus' authority, but the conflict that that brings. Uh, the Jewish ruling elite, the scribes, the priests, the Sadducees, they do not accept Jesus' authority. And really, these, these few chapters we come to tonight are the kind of climax of that theme. And again and again, someone challenges Jesus' authority. Uh, and, and again and again, he, he responds by pointing out their, their own hypocrisy and pride and stubbornness to, to his authority over them. And in one parable in particular, he calls out the leaders by saying that, that they have rejected God, by failing to care for his people, by uh, rejecting and killing his messengers, and even his son. Which brings us up to chapter 13, which is what we're going to read together just now. So uh, if you have a Bible there, or, or an app on your phone or something, uh, why don't you find Mark chapter 13? Um, we're going to read it in three sections. I'm going to split it up that way tonight, just because I think it's, it's quite a lot to get our heads around what Jesus is saying and meaning. So we're going to read, read it in three parts, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, break in the middle of the explanations as we go along. So uh, Mark chapter 13, and we'll just read verses 1 to 4 to start with. Okay. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked the private, Tell us, when will these things be? And, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So we'll pause there. So Jesus and his, and his disciples are in the, they've just left the temple uh, courtyard, they're sort of still within the temple complex with all its grandeur and might all around them. And this is still within a generation of, of King Herod's kind of refurbishing the whole thing, so it must have looked spectacular. He had Egyptian and Greek and Roman architects all working on it, and I guess particularly for a fisherman from Galilee, this must have seemed, it must have seemed unimaginable that a more magnificent building existed anywhere else in the world. But more significantly, this was also the house of God. This was the divine epicenter of the world, where God dwelt with his people, where sacrifices were, were offered, where atonement was made, where three times a year the whole people of God gathered together. But Jesus says, do you, do you see all this? All of it is going to get torn down. Can you imagine the disciples looking at each other and just thinking, what the... What's it about now? The temple? So they ask him, when, when is this going to happen? And, and how will we know? What will be the signs that will come before him? When, when will this happen and how will we know? And Jesus answers them in actually the other way around. He responds in the reverse order. He starts with how will we know, beginning with the signs part. Let's look, verses 5 to 27. And, and Jesus began to, to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And that if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. We'll pause again there. Well, what will be the signs of this uh, new age in history that is arriving? Uh, wars, earthquakes, famines, persecutions, tribulations, cosmic events even. But if we pay close attention, we, we see that Jesus is really describing not just the coming of one uh, new age in salvation history, but two. So first he tells the disciples about the coming end of the temple in Jerusalem. There will be an increase in persecutions and trials in Judea, he says. And then, when you see the abomination of desolation, where it should not be, verse 14, flee, for the end of the temple age is coming. Everything is going to change. And the abomination of desolation is, funnily enough, language taken from our favourite Old Testament prophet again, Daniel. It refers to, to kind of sacrilege, so the temple is going to be going to be um, desecrated by pagan idolatry, and then it will come to its end. But then Jesus seems to kind of switch focus. He swaps the lens he's using on his kind of apocalyptic like telescope. Um, and first he says in verse 24, but in, in those days, after that tribulation, so there's going to be a period of tribulation, and then verse 26, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So before he talks to the disciples about what you will see, and now he talks about what they will see. You see, Jesus has not one event in mind, but, but two. He says, I'll come and end to this period of Old Testament sacrifices and law. I will judge this city and its leaders, and this temple and all of its attachments will end. And then sometime later, after that, I will come back, just like Daniel saw, uh, Daniel saw there, on the clouds of glory, ready to receive the fullness of my eternal kingdom. I will judge not just this one city and this, and this temple, but the whole earth I will judge and claim what is mine. But the question remains, when? When are these two events going to happen? Do we know more? Let's get reading verse 28. From the fig tree, learn its lesson, Jesus said. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. But concerning that day, or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts a servant in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, 
in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. So again, Jesus, Jesus talks about, about two things. He talks in two parables. So first of all, verse 28, he speaks of the fig tree. Once again, it, it, it's, once its leaves are ready, the fig tree's leaves, so comes the fruit. That's how the plant works. And in the same way, when you see these signs, the abomination of desolation, the end of the age is very near. And it will come within this generation, he says. And so it did. So in 70 AD, that's a, that's a key date in biblical history, if you're into history, four years of, after four years of Jewish uprisings and war, and they, they recaptured their city for the Romans, the Romans came and they besieged the city and they burned the temple to the ground. And the temple has never been rebuilt. The old covenant age was no more. But we didn't see, at that point, Jesus coming on the clouds in glory, did we? Because he says about that day, nobody knows the year, the day, or the hour. Not even Jesus himself. Only the Father. Instead, we must be ready. Verse 32, Jesus' second illustration. It will be like the master of the house returning from a long journey, he says. None of the servants know when it's going to happen, but they know that they must be ready at all times, just in case. They must stay Awake. Now, what, what's the point of all this? You know, is Jesus just trying to get some good old apocalyptic literature in there so that Bible nerds and conspiracy theorists can argue about it for 2,000 years? Well, no, he's giving us a warning, isn't he? Three times in this passage, he says, be on your guard. Then in the last few verses, three times, he says, stay awake. He gave his disciples and the early church, his first followers, an important warning of what was going to happen soon. And soon it, it came. So this is what the first century historian Josephus writes about those events in 718. He tells us it's Passover time, so Jews from all over the nation are gathered by the temple. And so when the Roman legions charged into Jerusalem, all hell broke loose. Josephus wrote that the soldiers pretended not to hear their commander's orders, shouting at them to maintain order, and Josephus writes, passion alone was in command. He writes, round the altar, the heaps of corpses grew higher and higher, while down the sanctuary steps poured a river of blood. 1.1 million slaughtered and many more enslaved. This is what Jesus warns them about. It was coming. And judgment will come again for the whole world this time. Jesus will come and he will reign in full. If you don't believe him, then go read a history book or go visit Israel for yourself and look at where the temple once stood. That event stands as a marker forever that Jesus will return in judgment for all. And for Jesus' enemies, those that like the scribes in, in these Mark chapters, those that stand against Jesus' authority, even just those who have switched off to him, who have fallen asleep to his reign and to his kingdom, this judgment is not good news. I guess you might think of Mark chapter 8, where Jesus said, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So here's my question for you tonight. Are you on your guard for when he comes? Any day, any hour. Will you be one of his people waiting and ready for him? Will he find you awake or will he find you sleeping? This isn't the meek and mild Jesus you read about in your, in your children's story Bibles, is it? On this day coming, everything is going to be put back the way it should be. 
all wrongs righted, those committed against us, but also all of our sins and failings, totted up and accounted for in righteousness and in justice. What hell makes you feel? Well, here's the good news, something for us to remember. This returning judge, the Christ, the, the Son of Man, the one coming on the clouds in glory who owns everything, this man is also your shepherd. Because in the end, this warning from Jesus isn't just here to scare us, is it? It's here out of love. So imagine you are uh, driving on a country road late at night, and as you, as you come along the road, your headlights come across a um, black and white stripes going around in front of you, and then you, you look and you see, you see lights on the, on the road bending off one way, and then you see a sign, max speed 40. Well, at that moment, it's up to you, isn't it? Are you going to think, ah, oh, council? Again, just trying to spoil my driving fun. So floor it. Or are you going to think, the council has spent hundreds of pounds and hours putting these things up. Presumably, it's for a reason. Maybe it's, it's a good warning for me. And so slow down. But well, whenever you think of the, of the use of authority of your local county council, Jesus is speaking these warnings because he cares about his sheep, his people, his bride. He warned the early church of the judgment to come soon so that they might escape it. This is verse 14 again. When the abomination of desolation stand, is standing where he ought not to, let the reader understand, that's Mark's comment, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who was on the house not go down nor enter his house to take anything out, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Jesus, the good shepherd, wanted his precious flock to be safe. And the history books tell us that they were. So in AD 66, there was a Jewish rebellion against Roman taxes. It ignited the four years of struggle and war that led to the temple's eventual demise. And and the Romans initially responded to that rebellion by sending troops to the city and plundering the temple. And it seems that the Christians there at the time recognised those events as the signs that Jesus had spoken about. Because the whole Jerusalem church at that time packed up and they left. They left the city and they moved to the city of Pella, about 90 miles North, and there's, there's archaeological evidence that they, they thrived there for a good amount of time afterwards. The shepherd spoke words of warning to his people, and his people listened to his voice. They were on their guard. They stayed awake, and they were saved as a result. Well, look what the promises will ha uh, look what he promises will happen when he comes the second time in his glory. Verse twenty six. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. The Son of Man arriving to judge will gather his elect from the ends of the earth and he will keep them safe. Because he's not just the judge, he's the good and the good shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. Remember when he first spoke these words to his disciples, why was he in Jerusalem at all? Because he was on his way to the cross, where he died as the suffering servant, to pay the price for the sins of his chosen people, his bride, to take it all on himself, to let them go free. And when he returns, if you are found in him, if you are his, then you will not face that judgment that's coming at the end of this age. You will be like part of that first century church from Jerusalem, walking safely to Pella, with their family and friends around them, and, their, and with a wonderful future ahead of them, in their new home, 
following their good shepherd's loving warning. You will likewise be safe forever in your new home with him. So what about now? What shall we do then in the meantime while we wait for this coming day or hour? Well, here's three ways I think we should respond to the good shepherd from this passage. Number one, when the shepherd warns you, be on your guard. It's so tempting to fall asleep in this world. Just to become fascinated with the things of least significance around us. Just like the disciples, they, they marveled at the stonework of this temple around them, but they missed the upcoming judgment that Jesus had been hinting at all week long. We fritter away our days on TV shows and sports and fashion. I know these things are bad, but they're just like fancy temple architecture. Judgment is coming any day, and it will be rubble soon enough. The devil would love nothing more than for you just to slowly fall asleep while we wait for Jesus. The devil doesn't necessarily need you to, to fall away from your faith in some massive crisis of doubt or rage. If he can just make you slowly nod off to the priorities and the urgency of the gospel. Most people that I know who have stopped having a real living faith in Christ during their 20s just got busy with other stuff. Distracted by the world or by relationships or by work or whatever it was. They stopped going to church or they, they still turn up but they're not really there. Before you know it, they fall asleep. So hear the words of a shepherd who is the coming judge. Stay awake. Number one, when the shepherd warns, be on your guard. Number two, when the shepherd speaks, listen. What does Jesus warn in verse five? Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. There are many people who will try to impersonate your shepherds to you. Try to convince you that they are the one with ultimate authority, that, that their judgment on you is what's important. That their work and their words will be the ones that will change you or save you. Maybe this will be false teachers in the church, you know, posterity teachers on the internet, or false teachers even in this church family, or another one that you, one, that you one day attend. Maybe this will just be false teachers of the world. From the simple and the crass of, of buy this car or this perfume and your life will be sorted. To the subtle priorities and values that we come across all the time in, in TV and in books or whatever. You must not be led astray. You must not listen. You must listen to the voice of your true shepherd. You must stay awake. Keep your mind switched on. Don't just sleepwalk into thinking the same way that everyone else around you thinks. Listen to Christ. Read his word. The good shepherd has to put it in your hand. You have it on in your homes. You have it by your bed. You have it on an app in your pocket. That's how, that's how, much he, that's how lovingly he speaks to you. That's how easily you can listen to him speak by his spirit. Wherever you are, whatever you are, he speaks to you whenever you will listen. So one, when the shepherd warns, be on your guard. Number two, when the shepherd speaks, listen. And three, when the shepherd says, go. Verse 10. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When you face rejection or ridicule or the loss of relationships, or if you have to face legal action or even violence like the first Christians did, when that happens, 
you will be tempted to start keeping quiet. It's human nature to want to stop doing what is causing you pain or discomfort. But we cannot just stay quiet and fall asleep to the calling that Christ has given us. Stay awake, he says. What would happen if the church spent all of its time on things that are acceptable, even commendable, in the eyes of the world? Feeding the hungry. Saving the planet. But we neglected its highest and most pressing calling. Whatever unpopularity or or difficulties that might bring. That is telling the world that Christ is king. And that he is coming back to rule any day now. And the only way to escape the coming judgment is to throw yourself on his mercy and his grace. Don't get me wrong, as, you know, as a church, if you are here this morning, you heard about the food bank that we've been working. There's a connect group that looks at how to engage with uh, environmental concerns. None of these things are bad. They are good things to do. But it's possible to have a wrong balance. Listen, the, the, the message of this passage is clear. We need to live in the light of the fact that any day, any hour, judgment is coming. For everyone you know. When the shepherd says, go, stay awake. In the coming chapters, those words will be given to the disciples once more. Jesus ate the Passover meal with his friends for the last time. And he went to the gardens to pray in preparation for what would happen next. And, and then Mark tells us that he came back from praying and found the disciples asleep. He says to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Friends, temptation to fall asleep is all around us, like you know, like stuffy hot air in a in a room on on tired, heavy eyes in a lecture hall somewhere. The, the temptation to just drift away into slumber along with the rest of the world. But this passage opens our eyes. Judgment is coming. It is a true reality. Life and death is at stake. Will you be ready? Will you be found in Christ when he comes? Safe in your new home with his people? Will your friends and will your families be ready? Stay awake. When your shepherd warns, be on your guard. When your shepherd speaks, listen. When your shepherd sends, go. So we're going to pick up the story next time as Jesus is led away to be crucified. But, uh, but for now, let's, let's pray together and then we'll, we'll sing again. Father, we thank you so much for the words of your son. We thank you not just for his warning, his precious, loving words to us, that he he treats us with such care, that he tells us the truth so plainly about about what what is to come. And Father, I pray for myself, I pray for every single one of my brothers and sisters here tonight, that we would not fall asleep. Father, would you give us your spirit, Would would the eyes of our hearts remain open to you, Would we not just drift away into the into the ways of thinking, into the kind of slumber of the world, ignoring, naive about the coming judgment? Would we be awake? And would every moment of our lives be, be spent with that awareness of that coming day? Give us, give us the gifts, give us the energy, give us the boldness, give us the words we need, as, you, as Jesus promises by your spirit to speak truth to those around us. Father, keep us awake.